The Commission will come to order, and good afternoon, everybody. Today we will hear testimony on how governments and NGOs can more successfully identify and locate persons missing as a result of conflict, disasters, crimes such as human trafficking, and other violations of human rights, and hold accountable those responsible for perpetrating atrocities. Across the OSCE, thousands of families await knowledge of what happened to a relative from these causes of a profoundly human and humanitarian need that we cannot ignore. And of course, this tragedy is replicated all over the world, where people are lost and loved ones try to ascertain where are they, are they dead or alive, and, and that's why we meet today. This commission has not ignored this need over the years, particularly since the mid-1990s. We have held many hearings and have had fact-finding missions that have touched on missing persons from the conflicts in and between countries of the former Yugoslavia and both the International Commission on Missing and Persons and the Missing Persons Institute of Bosnia and Herzegovina have appeared here before as commission witnesses. Frank Wolf and I visited the Western Balkans, including Vukovar, in August of 1991 and Srebrenica when the region was still engulfed in ethnic hatred. And I returned to Srebrenica in July of 2007, where more than 10 years after the genocide, I saw the coffins prepared for burial with the remains of hundreds of men slaughtered in 1995, recently identified through the technologies developed by the International Commission on Missing Persons. I'll never forget the words of Ray Surich as he spoke at a very solemn ceremony, talking about the need for reconciliation, but also the need for justice. Uh, as he tried to comfort many of those survivors and loved ones who were there at that internment ceremony. But it is time also to take stock of this need, what governments and NGOs have done to respond to it or have not done, and I think about how that response can be further improved. The greatest concerted effort that has been made within the OSCE is to identify and locate missing persons was in the Western Balkans in the conflicts of the 1990s. More than 15 years after the end of the Bosnian conflict, and more than 10 years since the end of the heaviest fighting in Kosovo, most of the missing persons have been identified and located. And we are in a position to take stock of those efforts there and how lessons learned can be applied elsewhere. For example, in Sub-Saharan Africa, where the number of missing persons is absolutely staggering. I particularly want to draw attention to the magnificent work of the International Commission on Missing Persons, which has now located and returned the remains of over 18,000 victims of war alone, and is now in danger of losing ground gained because of difficulties over its legal status. One of the purposes of this hearing is to learn more about how we can support the ongoing work of the ICMP. At this moment, I'm preparing uh, to introduce legislation that would call on the Secretary of State to make every effort to advance at the UN a proposal for a permanent and internationally recognized legal status for the ICMP so that they can carry out its mandate on a global scale. I want to thank our distinguished witnesses for being here today, Queen Noor, uh, for making a very special effort uh, to be here and to provide testimony for this commission, which will give us additional uh, information to act upon. Finally, as the author of the Trafficking Victims Protection Act and its reauthorizations, I look forward to discussing with the witnesses the trafficking aspects of the missing persons tragedy, the identification and location of persons missing because they have been trafficked either on, in sex trafficking or in labor trafficking. I'd like to now yield to my good friend and colleague, Mr. Cohen, for any opening comments you might have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just appreciate your, your uh, hosting this hearing and having such a distinguished panel. The idea of missing persons in this age and time is, is anathema to civilized world and civilized society. And I know I, as a, uh, I was a history major, and have always been uh, uh, curious about Raw Wallenberg, and it's one of the missing uh, persons of, after World War II, and why the Soviets apparently took him, must have imprisoned him. I mean, it's not really clear, but his whereabouts were unknown. We've been concerned about our, our missing uh, and action folks in Vietnam and continue to and want them to know where they are and bring, bring them home if they're to be alive and if not, their remains. People want a resting place for their loved ones. Uh, that is a very important uh, uh, part of the healing process and part of the family that they want to, to 
take care of the, the, their family members, even if they've been killed, and see that they're given a proper burial. Uh, the, these particular instances where we see uh, trafficking uh, and people taking away, we have to find a way to use our scientific resources, which are great, our ability to, to conjure uh, the sciences for DNA technologies and, and other opportunities to identify people and use them to clear up mysteries and have a, a definity to uh, uh, the outcomes of war and uh, crime. So with that, I uh, just appreciate the opportunity to hear from the panel, to see what we can do as a commission, and thank the chairman for his work in scheduling the committee and yield back the balance of my time. Mr. Cohen, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Burgess. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank you for the recognition. Thanks for calling this hearing. The existence of missing persons is unfortunately one of the many lingering effects of the conflicts and turmoil that have happened in several areas over which this commission has, uh, has observation for the last few decades. From the Balkans to the Caucasus to Cyprus, far too many people remain unaccounted a fate that torments their families, wondering about their status and their well-being. The reasons for disappearance of individuals have multiple sources, from armed conflicts to human trafficking. At a state level, we can try to prevent wars, but the astonishing cruelty associated with other activities like human trafficking have eluded governments, and we must do more to combat the blight. I'll also just say on a personal note, although it's not the subject of this Commission's hearing today, I did have the opportunity to accompany General James Conway to a mass grave site just outside the city of Al Hilla in Iraq in 2003. It was an area that had just recently been opened up to the families, and I will never forget the, the pain that you could see etched on the faces of the families while they searched sometimes with their bare hands for evidence of a loved one that might have been interred in that, uh, in that grave that was estimated to contain 200,000 uh, Shiite Muslims. There have been some advances in piecing together clues to resolve the status of missing persons. In Cyprus, the United Nations and other groups have helped the two communities come together, identify some missing persons for the last few decades, but there is still so much to do. I hope the information that we hear from our witnesses today and the work that this commission is doing can help find those who are missing and prevent misfortune from happening in the future. Again, Mr. Chairman, it's an important subject, and I appreciate the recognition. I yield back. Dr. Burgess, thank you very much. We're now also joined by the Chairman of the NATO Parliamentary Assembly, uh, Mr. Turner, gentleman from Ohio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for having this important hearing, and I want to thank uh, the witnesses uh, for their highlighting what is an important issue as we look to um, the, um, the aftermath uh, at, of times of, uh, of conflict. Um, I was um, talking to Mr. Masevich and to uh, Queen Noor that my community is Dayton, Ohio, uh, where the Dayton Peace Accords were negotiated that uh, brought peace to, to the Balkans. And from that, my community has an affinity uh, for Bosnia and, of course, for the, the people there and, and the tragedy that ensued. My first trip to Bosnia was in um, July of 1996 with uh, Commerce Secretary Mickey Cantor as a follow-on to the tragic Ron, uh, Ron Brown a trip since then in my community, Dayton is a sister city to Sarajevo, and, and many of our um, uh, institutions are twinned, uh, hospitals, universities. Um, I had the opportunity, as the chairman was describing um, a couple years ago, to be at Srebrenica, where uh, 535 um, uh, bodies were returned to families for proper burial. And I was struck, as the chairman said, of uh, the, the peace uh, that uh, you could sense with the families as they received the remains of their loved ones that in part were identified uh, by, uh, by funding that the United States had, had provided to try to bring uh, an end to um, the wondering that people have uh, of what happened to their loved ones and to give them uh, that sense of, um, of closure. Uh, what you're doing in uh, raising this issue is, is so important because it brings also the issue of responsibility. Uh, so many times uh, where there has been a, a tragedy and uh, without the, the requisite proof, uh, justice is also something that, um, that is not forthcoming. So I appreciate your work on an international level and to highlight the, the need for this, not just in the Balkans, uh, but uh, as we look to conflicts um, throughout uh, uh, our globe. Thank you. Chairman Turner, thank you very much. I'd like to now introduce our distinguished witnesses, beginning with, and it is the high honor and extraordinary privilege for this commission to welcome Her Majesty Queen Noor, who is an active patron, president, and board member of numerous national and international organizations, including the United Nations organizations in the areas of mother and child health, education, women's development, environmental protection, culture and public architecture, and planning. 
In recognition of her efforts to advance development, democracy, and peace, the Queen has been awarded numerous honorary doctorates in international relations law and humane letters, uh, as well as other international awards. She heads the Noor Al Hussein Foundation, which was established in 1985 to, de to support development through education, environment, and cultural initiatives. Her Majesty became a commissioner of the International Commission on Missing Persons in June of 2001. We then hear from Sean Bray, who was appointed as the Deputy Director of Interpol, Washington, a component of the U.S. Department of Justice in February, February of 2010. In this capacity, Mr. Bray represents the U.S. Department of Homeland Security as its senior ranking official at Interpol, Washington. He is responsible for managing law enforcement agents, analysts, and various specialists who operate in divisions dedicated to specific investigative areas, alien, fugitive economic crimes, drugs, terrorism, violent crimes, human trafficking, and child protection, counterterrorism, state and local liaison uh, operations. Very busy man. We'll then hear from uh, Mr. Amor Ma Masovic, who is the chairman of the Bosnian Federal Commission for Missing Persons. He is a member of parliament of the Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina and a member of the International Association of Genocide Scholars. As chairman of the Commission for Missing Persons, he is responsible for maintaining the records of individuals and missing since the Bosnian War, efforts to trace such individuals, recording and identification of bodily remains, investigation of mass and individual graves, cooperation with local courts in conducting uh, a, 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 exhuming uh, autopsies, identification, and evidence gathering, and cooperation with UN specialized agencies and other international and national organizations. We'll hear all, then from Ms. Fatima Tislova, who is currently a writer, editor, and producer at Voice of America's Russian Service. She is also has experience as an investigative journalist, researcher, and expert on the Northern Caucasus region of Russia. She has written extensively on uh, Sir Caution nationalism, the role of Islam in regional affairs, human rights abuses during the military operations in the North Caucasus, torture, disappearances, and corruptions. She was editor-in-chief of Regnum News Agency, worked as a special correspondent in Gazeta, and reported for RFE, RL, and for the Associated Press. She has also appeared twice before our commission to witness uh, human rights and media freedoms in Russia. Uh, Queen Noor, uh, the yield to you for what time, such time as you may uh, consume. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the U.S. Helsinki Commission. Thank you for using this occasion to highlight the issue of persons missing from wars, violations of human rights, natural disasters. Thank you as well for inviting me as a commissioner of the ICMP, the International Commission of Missing Persons, to address an issue that I believe deserves much more attention than it receives. The missing are silent. They cannot plead their own cause. By definition and often by design, there are no horrific images or messages in the media to galvanize public outrage and they do not tweet from the scene nor set up Facebook pages to organize protests. They are simply gone. When people go missing, particularly through state-sanctioned violence, the family members left behind, usually women and children, are terrified to seek answers about the fate of their loved ones. In most of the world today, family members have no legal recourse to demand answers. Those brave enough to ask often fear reprisals from the very authorities responsible for the disappearance in the first place, or who are seeking to cover up the crimes of previous regimes. After all, it is a fundamental tenet of systems of law that if there is no body, there is no crime. And so the silence persists. Breaking that silence is a vital part of dealing with the past following violent conflict. It is important for reconciliation, nation building, and securing a peaceful future. It is critical for the healing process of the families left behind. Most importantly, addressing the problem of the missing is crucial to preventing future conflict. Mr. Chairman, 
ICMP estimates that in the world today, there are one million persons missing from war, violations of human rights, human trafficking, drug-related violence, and other causes. And that approximately 150,000 persons go missing every year from natural or man-made disasters. They, and those who mourn them, need help to break the silence. Mass graves are like open wounds. If these crimes are left unresolved, they breed hatred and can perpetuate a cycle of violence. The legacies of these crimes, particularly in the former Yugoslavia, are a painful reminder of that fact. It remains in the interest of the United States to help stop the cycle of violence by assisting post-conflict states in resolving the problem of the missing. The International Commission on Missing Persons was created in 1996 at the G7 summit in Lyon, France, at the initiative of United States President Clinton, as the only international effort to deal exclusively with the issue. I've had the privilege of serving as a member of ICMP for over a decade, and I take great pride in its work as an independent human rights organization. ICMP has a unique mandate. We work with governments to ensure that they take responsibility for ending the cruel uncertainty inflicted on the families of the missing, that they build rule of law institutions that allow for the missing to be located, recovered, and identified, and that they are held to account for atrocities committed. In short, that they end the silence. Equally important, we work with the families of the missing. We educate and empower them. We help with reconciliation efforts between families from different groups or different sides of the conflict. We help rebuild trust between civil society and states emerging from conflict by creating a space for dialogue between government authorities and the families of the missing so that they can demand answers. And we help craft legislation so that the right to information is enshrined in law. We also assist judicial institutions, both domestic and international, so that families of the missing can seek justice and perpetrators are held to account. In cases of natural or man-made disasters, as with the cases of missing persons from conflict and human rights abuses, ICMP uses the technology it is perhaps best known for, an integrated scientific approach based upon DNA ide identification technology. ICMP has so far assisted governments in making, as you just heard, over 18,000 DNA-based identifications. While ICMP now assists governments around the world, it was initially created to address the issue of persons missing from the conflicts in the former Yugoslavia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Serbia, Croatia, Kosovo, Montenegro, and Macedonia, where an estimated 40,000 persons disappeared. With the ICMP's help of those 40,000, 70% have been accounted for. That is an unprecedented achievement compared to any other region in the world that has had to deal with this issue. I know Srebrenica well. The name of that small town has become a symbol, a byword for inhumanity, the only recognized genocide on European soil since World War II, where 8,100 men and boys were executed in a matter of days and their bodies hidden in a series of mass graves strewn across the Bosnian countryside. I first visited in 1996, a year after the massacre, to bring humanitarian supplies from Jordan and to meet with thousands of grief-stricken survivors to express solidarity and support. Years later, I returned as an ICMP commissioner to meet and often weep with Bosniak, Serb, and Croat women and men as they struggle to come to terms with the disappearances of their husbands, sons, and fathers, killed in some cases by the husbands or sons of those sitting across the table from them. I remember their stories of being shunned from government offices and living neglected in collective centers, many with their fatherless children. ICMP reached out to them, to all of the families of the missing, regardless of ethnic, 
religious, or national origin. And they became our partners in the first ever effort to systematically and scientifically locate and identify their loved ones. Remarkably, many of them united across religious lines and worked together to fight for answers and to create lists of the relatives of the missing. And armed with this information, we began a large-scale effort across the former Yugoslavia to collect blood samples for DNA testing. Providing a blood sample soon became a powerful symbol for many of these families to declare their loss and to give of themselves to identify their loved ones. Mr. Chairman, I have been in the mass graves. I'm still haunted by the memory. I still cannot comprehend the barbarism that mankind is capable of inflicting on his fellow man. And the calculated, systematic attempts to strip these people of their humanity, to hide their bodies repeatedly so that they would never be identified in order to deny that these atrocities took place. And I've been in our ICMP DNA labs where identifications take place. We first started using DNA because all other methods to identify the missing have proved to be inadequate. I remember well that when I first became a commissioner, it seemed inconceivable that such a large number of persons could be identified and could be located and identified. ICMP made a bold decision to do something that had never been done before to use a technology, one that was still controversial in those days, even in court cases, and one that had certainly never been used following violent conflict, where large numbers of persons were missing. Skeptics said it was impossible, that at best we would be able to identify a 1,000 people, or that it would take 100 years, or that the costs would be prohibitive. I remember our early efforts to teach families of the missing about DNA. But this powerful scientific tool proved invaluable in efficiently providing irrefutable evidence of the identity of tens of thousands. Through painstaking work and exquisitely sensitive techniques of DNA analysis, ICMP is able to make genetic matches between DNA profiles taken from skeletal remains recovered from mass graves and DNA profiles provided voluntarily by living family members thus merging state-of-the-art science with human outreach in the service of justice and human rights. In a politically charged post-conflict region like the former Yugoslavia, where denial regarding mass killings is prevalent, having this type of precision helped combat the myth that events such as Srebrenica never happened. Today, of the approximately 8,100 persons killed and missing, from the fall of Srebrenica, ICMP has helped identify 6,700. Simultaneously, we worked with regional authorities to build the political, legal, and technical infrastructure that would allow governments to search for the missing, regardless of their ethnic, religious, or national origin. Critically, we helped them build rule of law institutions, such as the Missing Persons Institute in Bosnia, that work with the prosecutor's office to ensure that each illicit grave site or mass grave is investigated as the scene of a crime. In these cases, war crimes and crimes against humanity. Recently, we held a series of town hall meetings in the countries of the Western Balkans with the families of the missing. Now that majority of missing persons have been accounted for, the narrative has shifted from the desire to know the fate of the missing want justice. The holistic approach of ICMP working with governments, civil society, justice institutions, and providing scientifically based process of locating, recovering, and identifying the missing has set the parameters that will help the families pursue their legal rights and their desire for justice. Mr. Chairman, ICMP has broken the silence, and we hope that this new modern approach which has demonstrated that the missing can be found, will reverberate across other conflict regions. In order to expand on the success of the countries of the former Yugoslavia, as well as the heroic efforts of thousands of affected families in accounting for such a large number of missing persons, we have developed a set of principles which are listed in the documents that we have provided the Commission. 
While these principles provide important guidance for governments around the world faced with the issue of the missing, I am particularly concerned with countries in the OSCE states outside of the Western Balkans. The issue of missing persons affects almost one quarter of the OSCE states. Unfortunately, limited progress has been made over the past decade. For example, there are still three to 5,000 missing in Chechnya. Only 310 of the 1,500 to 2,000 people reported missing in Cyprus have been accounted for. And the almost 5,000 people are still reported missing from the gorno karabakh conflict. I would like to reiterate by comparison that the countries in the Western Balkans in just over a decade have been able to account for 70% of those missing, of which the vast majority were identified by DNA. These achievements are still not widely known, but ICMP stands ready to help these countries in the rest of the OSCE region break the silence on missing persons just as dramatically. I'd like to thank the U.S. Helsinki Mission for its tireless work in taking on tough human rights issues in Europe. I very much look forward to ICMP providing support to OSCE countries. With your support, the issue of missing persons as a result of armed conflict in Europe can be resolved. The silence on this issue cannot continue, and I hope this hearing will resonate throughout the OSCE region and beyond. Our breakthrough in using an integrated scientific approach to identify the missing also applies following natural or man-made disasters. ICMP has assisted Germany, Norway, and Austria in dealing with missing persons cases. In partnership with Interpol, ICMP has helped Thailand and the Maldives following the 2004 tsunami and the Philippines following Typhoon Frank in 2008. ICMP and Interpol are now in the process of expanding their partnership to create a permanent disaster victim identification platform. Mr. Chairman, the issue of missing persons presents a global challenge that demands a global solution. ICMP, with its specialized technology and expertise, is the only organization in the world capable of doing so effectively and efficiently. ICMP's work has expanded since our early days in the former Yugoslavia, and we are currently assisting Iraq, where up to one million persons are reported missing. And we have helped Colombia, Chile, South Africa, El Salvador deal with missing persons from human rights abuses and conflict. ICMP's work has also benefited the United States. I'm proud to say that ICMP helped the state of Louisiana identify missing persons following Hurricane Katrina. And I vividly remember meeting with the mayor of New York City soon after the 9-11 disaster to offer our assistance. His, um, his um, articulation, if you will, of, the, um, of what he had been told by the surviving uh, family members of victims of um, the World Trade Center um, disaster, in fact, uh, were verbatim what I had been hearing uh, from families in Serbia, Croatia, Kosovo, and Bosnia. Sadly, in many other places where requests for our assistance has come from, governments or NGOs such as Georgia, Azerbaijan, Armenia, Kyrgyzstan, Nepal, Kashmir, Sri Lanka, Uganda, Lebanon, Algeria, Morocco, and most recent Libya, we've had great difficulty in gaining support and funds to provide desperately needed assistance despite our successes, particularly in the Western Balkans where we will soon end our active engagement. In addition, we are receiving increasing demands to help with missing persons cases related to human trafficking, drug-related violence, and a whole host of other causes. The need for knowledge for closure in these situations is universal, and providing it is critical to overcoming anger and despair and restoring stability to families, communities, and nations. The fundamental human rights work of ICMP is not only palliative, it is preventative. The healing and recovery it provides the victims, as well as the process of accountability it helps foster with governments, are absolutely integral to the process of healing, reconciliation, justice, and ultimately conflict prevention. In closing, I would also like to thank my fellow ICMP commissioners from around the world who volunteer their time to assist ICMP. 
And in particular, I would like to acknowledge and thank the current and previous chairpersons of ICMP, including Cyrus Vance, Bob Dole, James Kimsey, and the current chair, Ambassador Thomas Miller. I'd also like to thank the governments that support ICMP's work, particularly the United States. The support of the United States State Department was critical in creating ICMP and making it a success story. I hope that this important support will continue. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much uh, for a very, very eloquent statement, comprehensive, and for the great work that you and your organization does in this behalf. Uh, we are joined by uh, uh, Commissioner Pitts, as well as by Chairman Pitts and Chairman uh, Frank Wolf. Uh, Frank, would you? Okay, caught him as he was sitting down. I'd like to now ask to Mr. Bray if you have um, uh, previous provided your testimony. Good afternoon, Chairman Smith, distinguished members of the commission, ladies and gentlemen. It is an honor to appear before you today on behalf of Interpol to discuss how the International Criminal Police Organization is helping law enforcement overcome obstacles to locating and identifying missing persons around the world, as well as here at home. Interpol Washington is a component of the U.S. Department of Justice and is co-managed by the Department of Homeland Security. We are the statutorily designated representative to Interpol on behalf of the Attorney General. As such, we become the official point of contact for all Interpol-related matters in the United States. Although primarily not noted for its work in locating and apprehending transnational criminals and fugitives, Interpol plays a significant and important role in responding to requests for humanitarian assistance that may involve such matters as missing persons, victim identification, death notifications, threatened suicides, and health and welfare checks for persons around the world. Using a sophisticated communications network, Interpol provides the world's law enforcement authorities with access to a variety of tools and resources that are being used to great effect in these humanitarian efforts as part of either an individual inquiry or investigation or in response to a larger scale disaster. One of Interpol's most important functions is to enable the world's police to exchange investigative information quickly and securely. Accordingly, Interpol has developed the I-24-7, a noted system that is encrypted, internet-based, establishes communications, and a network that facilitates police-to-police -police interaction in real time, enabling users in 190 member countries to share crucial police data and access Interpol databases and services each day. Services that are currently available through the I-24-7 include secure messaging, direct access to Interpol's databases of nominal information, such as fingerprints, photographs, DNA profiles, and biographical details on subjects of Interpol notices. These notices, which are color-coded to indicate their specific purpose, are distributed to law enforcement authorities in the Interpol member countries for purposes that include, but are certainly not limited to, locating and seeking the arrest of fugitives, such as the famous red notice, locating missing persons, or helping identify persons who are not able to identify themselves, as in a yellow notice, and seeking information about unidentifying persons <coughs> who are deceased, which is a black notice. These very systems, which have allowed Interpol member countries to locate and apprehend serious and violent criminal offenders around the world, also enable the organization to provide real-time assistance in locating and identifying missing persons as well as others who are of official interest or concern to law enforcement. For example, Interpol is currently implementing the FAST ID system. This is a system that began with a conceptualization and a realization that no centralized, truly global police database exists for use in identifying missing persons and or unidentified bodies. Accordingly, Interpol began development of such a database with the objective of providing decentralized access to its member countries through the I-24-7 and for use in conjunction with the larger scale disasters and regular policing activities that they face every day. The data used in the FAST ID system will be obtained from Interpol's Disaster Victim Identification Program, its forms and deployments, together with information provided in the corresponding yellow and black notices in its data sets. Once entered, the data is processed through three separate components designed to increase opportunity for positive identification. The system merges components collected from the Interpol notices, secondary identifiers, but certainly important identifiers, such as clothing, body markings, piercings, jewelry, and ultimately will include facial recognition. 
However, the main component collects primary identifiers from the existing databases which you've heard about today, such as fingerprints, DNA, and dental records. Interpol launched the prototype of the FAST ID system in 2011. Interactive testing of that system is currently being conducted with the objective of moving to full phase testing later in 2012, followed by full implementation across its member countries. FAST ID is the newest component of Interpol's well-developed services that constitute its DVI program. Interpol's DVI program utilizes internationally recognized processes and standards for identifying victims of major disasters such as terrorist attacks or earthquakes, where visual recognition, pardon me, recognition is not possible or may be severely limited. Under such circumstances, comparison by fingerprints, dental records, or stored DNA samples are typically required for conclusive identification. Interpol's DVI services include command and coordination assistance, fully deployable inter incident response teams that can provide on-site investigative support or direct connectivity to Interpol's investigative databases and uh, command center. Interpol's DVI activities are led by the organization's Standing Committee on Disaster Victim Identification. This committee is comprised of forensic and police experts from around the world that meet regularly to discuss improvements to standards and procedures in these matters. Interpol's standards and guidelines for disaster victim identification are backed by specific training programs that include victim care and family support, compliance with international standards and forensic quality assurance controls, information sharing and exchange, and operational assistance to countries lacking disaster victim identification capacity. Many of these standards were developed in partnership with organizations and member countries. Such organizations as the International Commission on Missing Persons have been crucial in these efforts. I am also pleased to report that in 2014, Interpol will open its Interpol Global Complex for Innovation, or IGCI. This state-of-the-art facility in Singapore will focus on innovative research and capacity building for law enforcement agencies worldwide. One of its primary functions will be to enhance Interpol's DVI forensic capabilities and serve as a global resource and ultimately a platform for ensuring adequate levels of disaster preparedness. Interpol actively supports its member countries' law enforcement efforts to investigate serious transnational crimes, including genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. Interpol's Fugitive Investigative Support Subdirectorate focuses specifically on three key areas of assistance to provide support to its member countries. It focuses on operations, networking, and training. While operational support is achieved through the publication of the red notices, an international alert for locating and apprehending fugitives and wanted persons, training support is also provided to enhance capacity and proficiency in law enforcement agencies around the world specifically with processing forensic evidence related to mass atrocities, skills that are necessary in locating, recovering, and identifying victim remains and successfully prosecuting perpetrators of these horrific crimes. In the United States, Interpol Washington uses the I-24-7 and the Interpol Notice System to support domestic and foreign law enforcement efforts to locate missing children, abducted children, missing adults, and unidentified deceased persons. For example, within the framework of our Missing and Abducted Children's Program, Interpol Washington's Human Trafficking and Child Protection Division publishes yellow notices and diffusions to seek the location and safe return of missing U.S. children to their parents. Similarly, incoming requests from our foreign law enforcement counterparts are entered into U.S. indices, including the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. This information is promptly shared with law enforcement agencies nationwide in regard to children who are missing, removed from, or brought to the U.S by a non-custodial parent. In furthering these efforts, Interpol Washington also coordinates with the U.S. Department of State Office of Children's Issues, which manages the complementary Hague Convention cases that we undergo. Through our International Missing Persons Program, Interpol Washington's Alien Fugitive Division utilizes yellow notices to locate and identify persons over the age of 18 who have been reported missing by domestic and foreign law enforcement agencies. Similarly, the International Unidentified Dead Body Program uses Interpol black notices and directs inquiries from member countries to assist in identifying remains of unidentified deceased persons recovered by law enforcement authorities worldwide. Mr. Chairman, distinguished members of the Commission, the theme of today's testimony is how can we overcome obstacles to locating and identifying persons who have become missing from a variety of causes, both man-made and natural in nature. As we are all aware, efforts to locate and identify missing persons oftentimes have an international dimension that truly requires an international response. 
In order to respond effectively, U.S. law enforcement authorities and our foreign counterparts must be able to overcome the very real linguistic, cultural, and legal barriers that complicate the exchange of investigative information and often present, prevent support across international boundaries. As the world's largest organization for policing, Interpol provides the necessary communications network, framework for police cooperation, and investigative tools and services essential to our success. As the National Central Bureau of Interpol for the United States, Interpol Washington is an active partner in international law enforcement efforts to ensure the timely location and identifica identification of such persons. I would like to conclude by thanking the U.S. Helsinki Commission and your professional staff in particular for your continuing and tireless efforts to promote human rights. The hearing is certainly a continuing testimony to your commitment and dedication to such a worthy cause. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bray, for your testimony and for your outstanding work, which this commission and really the Foreign Affairs Committee has, since I work on human rights, we followed very carefully. Thank you so much. I'd like to ask uh, Ms. Tislova uh, if she would proceed. Thank you, Chairman Smith uh, and the members of the Helsinki Commission for the honor to speak here today. I I appear before you in my professional capacity as a reporter for VOA's Russian service and not as a private citizen. And I will, I will testify honestly and from the best of my knowledge. At the VOA Russian service, we run a special section called Caucasus Today. In this series of reports, we are aiming to present interviews and opinions of experts who are focused on the situation in this region, as well as giving voice to the people from the North Caucasus, among whom are journalists, lawyers, and human rights activists, members of the government forces, and victims of the human rights abuses. As a journalist responsible for the Caucasus section at the VOA Russian, I personally am in direct contact with representatives of society in the North Caucasus on a daily basis. To give you an impression of the extent of those connections, I can tell you that the night before yesterday, a Skype call woke me woke me up at three in the morning. It was a human rights activist from tiny republic of Ingushetia begging me to spread information on the latest disappearance. 23 years old Rustam Aushev was kidnapped. His relatives were able to collect a video recording from security cameras that show how Rustam was taken by men in civilian clothes. Relatives also have a witness testimony from the local highway patrol officers who said that upon the request to remove a vehicle from a restricted area, the person in the van presented them the ID of an FSB officer. This was the same car that, as recorded on the video, drove away from with Rustam Aushev. The human rights activist who called me that night said Rustam might still be alive. With, they, with days passing, the chances that his family will ever see him again are vanishing. Usually after two weeks, people start collecting money to bribe officials to buy back the body of their loved ones. This is a story not of just one particular person. This is a story of hundreds of families and thousands of young men and women. I'm not, refer I'm not referring to the statistics in my testimony. The numbers are available in the, re in the regular reports of the major human rights organizations. As impossible as they sound, according to the information from the local NGOs, they do not represent the real data, which is much larger. My testimony is based on an observation of the lat latest reports performed by the VOA Russian service. I will address main issues by quoting cert certain stories. Uh, first, the role of the law. The special amendment to Russia's criminal code introduced by Vladimir Putin puts the FSB, the former KGB, in a special position, which gives them unlimited authority in initiating and performing counterterrorism operations, so-called KTO. In his video interview to, uh, to VOA, the United Nations Special uh, Rapporteur on Human Rights and Counterterrorism, Martin Shanin, underlined that the main problem with Russia's definition of terrorism is uh, that it often used against, uh, that is, it is often used against political opponents, giving the, giving the authorities the ability to expand the usage of anti-terrorism law against persons and groups who do not employ 
uh, employ ter <coughs> terrorist methods based on the current law the russian security services are able to create black lists which do not imply any legal mechanism for the people who are on those lists to defend their lives and their reputation the role of security services in a skype interview to voa Nazir Ivloyev, the former officer of the police in the North Caucasus, confirmed that the federal security services are directly involved in forced disappearances. Kidnapped persons are being subjects of brutal torture and post, post, posthumously labeled as uh, members of terrorist extremist groups. The bodies are disposed and thousands of, of families have never granted a luxury to properly bury their loved ones. The role of judiciary system. Anzor Sasikov was kidnapped in Nalchik. For two weeks, his family did not know anything of his whereabouts. When his name appeared, then his name appeared among detainees accused in an attempt to overthrow Russian government. In his letter from prison to European Court of Human Rights, Anzor wrote, For a very long time, I was beaten brutally in a perverted perverted manner. After I signed empty sheets of paper, they brought me to the judge, naked and covered in blood. I do not remember the face of the judge, who gave them a warrant for my arrest, without even asking a single question about my condition. In her interview to VOA, independent lawyer from kabardino balkaria Larisa Dorogova said that kidnapping is followed by detention, in which the victim is tortured to the point when he signs a blank blank papers. After that, he can be accused in any crime. Her colleagues from Dagestan and Chechnya, Sapiat Magomedova and Magomed Abubakarov, when interviewed by VOA, said that detained persons are denied the right to an independent lawyer. They have to accept the lawyers appointed by the state. The three of them independently made a statement that the judiciary system in the North Caucasus is fully under control of the security services. Decisions are politically motivated, predetermined, and predetermined by the orders from the FSB and do not represent justice. A former member of the Russian Presidential Commission on Human Rights and the well-known journalist Maxim Shevchenko, when interviewed by VOA, underlined that the Kremlin's brutal policy towards the North Caucasus is the very source of radicalization and alienation of the Caucasus. He said that people are forced to live with the knowledge that for this state, their lives value zero. Violence committed by the government forces produces hatred and vengeance. Without a fundamental change of policy, this region is doomed to become a, a threat not only to Russia, but to Europe in whole. There are many other aspects of this problem, to this problem. To the best of my ability, I gave you very few major issues that support the system where forced disappearances are not only possible but represent a very basic and a common tool for mass violations of human rights in the North Caucasus. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so very much for your testimony. Mr. Masovich. Hvala gospodine predsjedavajući, uvaženi kongresmeni, senatori, dame i gospodo. U svom predstavljanju reći ću vam da već 20 godina sudjelujem u procesima evidentiranja, pronalaženja i identificiranja nestalih osoba na području Bosne i Hercegovine i susjednih država, a čiji nestanci su rezultat ratova vođenih početkom 90. godina prošlog stoljeća. U tom razdoblju od 92. godine do danas predvodio sam timove i institucije koji su locirali više od 500 masovnih i više od 5000 pojedinačnih grobnica sa posmrtnim ostacima više od 16000 žrtava prisilnih nestanaka. Kao rezultat rata, genocida, zločina protiv čovječnosti i međunarodnog prava zabilježen je nestanak oko 30.000 ljudi u Bosni i Hercegovini i još oko 10.000 u Hrvatskoj, Srbiji i Kosovu. Uglavnom se radi o civilnom stanovništvu, muškarcima, ženama i djeci koji su nestali u istočnim i zapadnim dijelovima Bosne i Hercegovine uz rijeku Drinu, koja predstavlja granicu između Bosne i Hercegovine i Srbije i na zapadu u dolini rijeke Sane. Više od jedne četvrtine svih nestalih su muškarci i dječaci, 
nestali tokom napada vojnih i policijskih snaga Karadžića i Mladića na zaštićenu zonu Ujedinjenih naroda Srebrenca u julu 1995. godini. Samo u nekoliko dana jula mjeseca strijeljano je ili na drugi način likvidirano najmanje 8.300 bošnjaka iz zaštićene zone. Činjenice koje sam naveo vode nas ka definiranju najvećih prepreka u procesima traženja nestalih i lociranju identifikaciji žrtava prisilnih nestanaka. Činjenica da su prisilni nestanci u najvećem broju slučajeva posljedica genocida i drugih ratnih zločina nad civilima, a samo u manjem procentu populaciju nestalih predstavljaju borci nestali u akciji. S druge strane, činjenica je da se Bosna i Hercegovina deceniju i pol nakon okončanja rata još uvijek nije spremna suočiti sa svojom prošlošću i obračunati sa organizatorima i počiniocima masovnih ratnih zločina. Nemali broj predstavnika vlasti od najnižeg do najvišeg nivoa još uvijek ne želi postupati u skladu sa međunarodno preuzetim obavezama, pa čak niti u skladu sa obavezama koje nam nameću zakoni Bosne i Hercegovine kao što je zakon o nestalim osobama. For the past 20 years I'm participating in the process of identifying, finding and registering missing persons on the territory of Bosnia and Herzegovina, whose disappearances is a result of an armed conflict which, which occurred in the beginning of the 90th century, 90 in the past century. In the period between 1992 through present, I was leading many teams and institutions who managed to locate over 500 mass graves and more than 5,000 individual grave sites filled with human remains and more than 60,000 victims of forced disappearances. As a result of war, genocide, crimes against humanity and international law, it is documented disappearance of approximately 30,000 people in Bosnia and Herzegovina and approximately 10,000 in Croatia, Serbia and Kosovo. Generally, I'm speaking of civilian population, men, women and children who disappeared in eastern and western part of Bosnia and Herzegovina. The geographical territory in the east is along the flow of River Drina, which banks, borderlines, the country of Serbia, and in the west along the flow of River Sana. More than quarters of all missing persons were men and boys that disappeared during the military and police force aggression conducted by Karadžić and Mladic. These forces operated on territory in and around the town Srebrenica, which was protected by the flag of UN peacekeeping forces. The facts are that only in the period of few days in the month of July 1995, at least 8,300 Bosnians were assass assassinated in the shooting range or mercilessly killed. All these atrocities happened while the people of Bosnia and Herzegovina were under the protection of the U.S. peacekeeping forces. All above mentioned facts are the obstacles in the process of finding and identifying the victims of enforced disappearances. Particularly, the fact is that the largest number of the enforced disappearances were a result of genocide and the forms of war atrocities committed against civilians. And only a small number of disappeared were members of the military and police forces, which were missing in action. On the other hand, it is the fact that Bosnia Herzegovina, in a decade and a half, still is not prepared to face the past and confront the orga organizers and perpetrators of the mass crimes. Not a small number of government representatives from the low-level positions to high-level positions are not willing to act with the accordance of the international obligations, neither with the accordance of the laws of Bosnia and Herzegovina, such as the law of the missing persons of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Hronični nedostatak informacija o počinjocima ratnih zločina, o žrtvama prisilnih nestanaka, o lokacijama i identitetu žrtava, o izmještanju primarnih u sekundarne grobnice, glavna je prepreka zbog koje Bosna i Hercegovina do danas nije uspjela u cijelosti riješiti svoj problem nestalih osoba. Odgovorni pojedinci i vlasti ne samo da odbijaju dostaviti raspoložive informacije koje bi pomogle u lociranju grobnica, već uskraćivanjem svoje podrške sudu i tužilaštvu Bosne i Hercegovine direktno obstruiraju proces utvrđivanja istine i postizanja pravdi. Sud i tužilaštvo Bosne i Hercegovine uz Međunarodni krivični sud za bivšu Jugoslaviju optužili su i osudili određeni broj odgovornih za prisilne nestanke, 
ali ih izostanak političke i svih drugih oblika pomoći i podrške sprečavaju da budu još efikasniji. Međunarodni tužioci i sudije koji su angažirani u lokalnim pravosudnim institucijama trpe stalne udare i pritiske od strane pojedinih političara koji ne samo da ne izvršavaju svoje obaveze, već u posljednje vrijeme nastoje minimizirati ili čak potpuno negirati da su se ratni zločini, uključujući genocid i prisilni nestanci uopće i desili. Takav odnos pojedinaca i grupa u vlastima posebno teško pogađa i ostavlja trajne posljedice kod preživjelih članova porodica nestalih osoba, posebno kod onih koji još uvijek tragaju za svojim najmilijim i koji su zbog takvog odnosa sve više uvjereni da njihovi voljeni nikada neće biti pronađeni. Nedostatak jasno iskazane političke volje da se suočimo sa svojom prošlošću i istinom, makako ona užasna bila, prepreka je za brže i efikasnije rješavanje problema nestalih, ne samo u Bosni i Hercegovini, nego i u cijeloj regiji. Do istog zaključka došla je i radna grupa o prisilnim nestancima koja dijeluje u okviru organizacije Ujedinjih naroda. Stoga je od iznimne važnosti da vlasti Bosne i Hercegovine bez odlaganja implementiraju sve preporuke radne grupe i stvore uvjete za ubrzanje procesa eksumacije i identifikacija žrtava. U tom smislu neophodno je sljedeće. Podržati i osnažiti nezavisnost instituta za nestale osobe Bosne i Hercegovine, obezbijediti više resursa i svu potrebnu tehnologiju za otkrivanje grobnica. Vlada Bosne i Hercegovine treba dati više političke i finansijske podrške institutu za nestale osobe, povećati broj tužilaca koji rade na eksumacijama i krivičnom gonjenju ratnih zločina, osigurati plodne dialoge između vlasti i porodica nestalih u cilju osnaživanja njihova prava da saznaju istinu i da ponovo izgrade međusobno povjerenje, obezbijediti veći broj forenzičkih patologa kako bi se ubrzao proces identifikacije, uspostaviti funkcionalni forenzički centar na državnoj razini, privesti pravdi, naredbodavce i počinioce zločina kako bi se ojačao proces otkrivanja istine, ojačati programe zaštite svjedoka kako bi se ohrabrili da otkriju informacije vezane za mjesta grobnica, pružiti pomoć porodicama žrtava koje su povremeno izložene prijetnjama, maltretiranjima i ucjenama, ustanoviti u krivičnim zakonima prisilni nestanak kao zasebno krivično dijelo tako da se za njega može izreći kazna i onda kada se ne može kvalificirati kao zločin protiv čovječnosti, onemogućiti davanje amnestije za počinioce i odgovorne za prisilne nestanke, prisilne nestanke posmatrati kao kontinuirani zločin što će omogućiti primjenu i oni zakona koji su doneseni nakon što su se prisilni des, nestanci desili, a da pritome neće biti narušen princip nego mogućnosti retroaktivne primjene novih krivičnih zakona. Radna grupa za prisilne nestanke Ujedinjih naroda posebno naglašava u svojim preporukama vlastima Bosne i Hercegovine ključnu ulogu Međunarodne komisije za nestale osobe, ICMP-a, posebno u procesu identifikacije žrtava prisilnih nestanaka putem DNA metode, te traži od vlasti da omoguće da ICMP i u budućnosti ostane aktivno angažiran u Bosni i Hercegovini. Mr. Chairman, we face chronic absence of information about the perpetrators of the crimes, about the victims and of forced disappearance, about the locations and the identity of victims, about this dislocated primary into the secondary gravesite. All above mentioned facts are the main obstacles that Bosnia-Herzegovina is still facing and the obstacles they are still in a way for solving the problems of missing persons. Accountable individuals and accountable government officials, not only that they refuse to supply the information which would help in locating the gravesite, yet they refuse to support the state court and prosecutor's office of Bosnia-Herzegovina and directly obstruct the process of determining the truth and achieve the justice. The state court and prosecutor's office of Bosnia-Herzegovina, in the collaboration with the International Criminal Court for, for the former Yugoslavia, accused and convicted certain number of responsible persons for the forced disappearances, but the absence of political and all other forms of help and support are preventing them to be even more effective. International prosecutors and judges who are involved in the local judicial institutions suffer constant attacks and pressure from the certain politicians 
which do not only not perform their duties, but recently tried to minimize and altogether negate the occurrence of the crime, war crimes, including genocide and forced disappearances. This behavior of certain individuals and government groups leave consequences on the family members of missing persons, especially the family members that are still searching for the loved ones. And because of this behavior, they're becoming more and more aware that their loved ones might not ever be found. The shortcomings is in a clearly stated political will to confront our past and truth, no matter how horrifying it is, it is an obstacle in a faster and more effective solution of the missing persons problem, not only in Bosnia and Herzegovina, but in whole region. Absolutely, the same conclusion was realized by the working group of enforced and involuntary disappearances organized by the United Nations. Therefore, it is extremely important, it's of extremely importance that the government of Bosnia and Herzegovina implements without any delay the recommendations by the working group and creates conditions for speeding up the process of exhuming and identifying the victims. To that effect, the following points are essential to support and empower the independence of the Institute for the Missing Persons of Bosnia and Herzegovina, provide more resources and required technology for finding mass graves. The government of Bosnia and Herzegovina needs to pro provide more political and financial support to the institutions for the missing persons, increase the number of prosecutors who are engaged in exhumation and criminal prosecution of war criminals, provide fruitful negotiations between the government and the families of the missing persons in order to ensure their rights to find the truth and repair the lost trust, provide larger number of forensic pathologists to ensure a faster process of identification, establish functional forensic center on the state level, bring to justice key commanders and all other criminals in order to strengthen the process of revealing the truth, strengthen the program of protection for witnesses in order to come forward with information for the location of the mass grave sites, provide support to the families of the victims who are still exposed to the attacks, threats, and harassments. Legislate in the criminal law that the enforced disappearance is an individual criminal act so in cases where it's not possible to convict for the crimes against humanity, prosecution will still be able to convict and sentence. To make it possible to grant amnesty for the accused of enforced disappearance, regard the enforced disappearance as a continuous crime which is going to enable implementation of all other laws which are passed after the occurrence of forced disappearances. This will not undermine the principle of the retroactive implementation of the newly passed laws. Working group on enforced and involuntary disappearances by the UN specifically points out in the recommendation to the government of Bosnia and Herzegovina the key role of the International Commission for the Missing Persons and recommends that the commission remains active and stays active in the future involvements in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Poštovani predsjedavajući, na kraju Ipak želim naglasiti da uprko s mnogim peprekama i očiglednim obstrukcijama o kojima sam govorio u uvodu ovog izlaganja, Bosna i Hercegovina ostaje lider u svijetu po pitanju rješavanja velikog broja nestalih osoba. Naš model rješavanja sudbina nestalih već se prepoznaje u svijetu kao jedinstveni bosanski model. Za stvaranje tog jedinstvenog bosanskog modela nije bio dovoljan samo entuzijazam nekolicine bosanaca, koji smo od samog početka bili uključeni u rješavanje sudbina nestalih osoba, već je bila potrebna i svesrdna pomoć i saradnja sa Međunarodnom komisijom za nestale osobe, Međunarodnim krivičnim sudom za bivšu Jugoslaviju, lokalnim tužiocima, sudijama, policajcima, forenzičarima. Ta bogata i plodna saradnja s jedne strane i želja preživjelih članova porodice da saznaju sudbinu svojih voljenih doniranjem jedne kapljice svoje krvi doveli su nas do u svijetu nezabilježenog impresivnog rezultata. Doveli su nas do pronalaženja gotovo 22,5 hiljade nestalih osoba. Doveli su nas do identifikacije gotovo 20 hiljada žrtava prisilnih nestanaka, čija starosna dob se kreće od bebe starosti dva dana do starice stare 102 godine. Više od 90 hiljada ljudi doniralo je svoju krv ICMP-u sa željom da na taj način saznaju istinu o sudbini svojih voljenih. 
Stoga sam uvjeren da će Međunarodna komisija za nestale u budućnosti ostati naš glavni saveznik u otkrivanju sudbine preostalih oko 7.500 nestalih u Bosni i Hercegovini, te da će zadržati lidersku poziciju koju ICMP ima u svijetu po broju identificiranih žrtava genocida, ratnih zločina, prirodnih katastrofa ili nesreća prouzrokovanih ljudskim faktorom. Rješavanje sudbine nestalih nije i ne smije biti samo problem članova njihovih porodica. To je prije i iznad svega problem bosansko-hercegovačkog društva u cijelini. Bez kvalitetnog i efikasnog rješavanja ovog problema teško je očekivati da će se u doglednoj budućnosti dogoditi ono za čim žudi velika većina bosanaca i hercegovaca, a to je povratak povjerenja među ljudima, kao bitan preduvjet za postizanje pune saradnje i stabilnosti u zemlji i regionu. Uvjeren sam da će ova prilika koju mi je pružio Helsinški odbor na čelu sa uvaženim kongresmenom i dokazanim prijateljem Bosne i Hercegovine, gospodinom Kristoferom Smitom, nosiocem najvećeg priznanja koje dodjeljuju porodice žrtava genocida, potočarske povelje, i moje današnje svjedočenje, kao svjedočenje svih ostalih učesnika, biti dodatni poticaj za vlasti u Bosni i Hercegovini, kao i vlade drugih država u Sjedinim američkim državama i u Evropi, koje su i do sada, a uvjeren sam i u buduće, biti neodvojivi dio jednog uspješnog projekta ili jedne uspješne priče o rješavanju sudbina nestalih u Bosni i Hercegovini, kako bi se pronašli svi oni kojima su agresija i surovi ratovi zameli svaki trag, i kako bi se njihovi posmrtni ostaci predali porodicama koje dvije decenije od početka rata zaslužuju da dobiju svoj smiraj. Moja zemlja vjerovatno nikada neće biti u prilici da se na pravi način oduži građanima Sjedinjenih američkih država, njezinoj vladi, za sve ono što su američke vlasti, uključujući i državne sekretare, mnoge kongresmene, mnoge senatore, pripadnike američke vojske, pregovarače, diplomate i mnoge druge, ali vas uvjeravam da velika većina građana Bosne i Hercegovine i tekako dobro poznaje vašu ulogu u okončanju rata i kažnjavanju odgovorni za ratne zločine. Ljudi koje ja predvodim kao i stotine građana Bosne i Hercegovine koji su bili upućeni na pomoć ICMP-a, zamolili su me da pred ovim komitetom iskažem njihovu iskrenu i duboku zahvalnost dosadašnjim liderima Međunarodne komisije za nestale, gospodinu Vensu, gospodinu Dolu, gospodinu Kimziju, ambasadoru Milleru i posebnu zahvalnost njenom veličanstvu, kraljici Nur, koja je znala prepoznati svu bol i patnju koju u svojim srcima nose majke, sestre i kćeri Bosne, što godinama istrajava u nastojanjima da im olakša živote prepune ljudske traume. I konačno, zahvalnost osobi koja je s nama i porodicama žrtava od samog početka, zahvaljujući njoj i njenoj upornosti, danas Bosna i Hercegovina ima zakon o nestalim osobama, institut za nestale osobe, zahvaljujući njoj desetine i desetine hiljada bosanaca i bosanki našli su svoj smiraj. Hvala gospođi Ketrin Bomberger i svim učinima. Njenim saradnicima. Mr. Chairman, lastly, I would like to emphasize that in spite of the obstacles previously mentioned, Bosnia and Herzegovina remains the leader in the world for solving the missing persons cases. I am sure that this opportunity to testify that was given to me by the Helsinki Committee and under leadership of Honorable Congressman Smith, uh, who was honored with the biggest award given by the families of the vic victims called Patočarska Povelja, and the testimony of all others involved with future, future motivate United States of America and European community continue this successful project or a story about discovering the final destinies of the missing in Bosnia. I believe that my country will never be able to thank properly the people of United States of America, United States government, state secretaries, members of the Congress, senators, members of the U.S. armed forces, negotiators, diplomats, and many others for every assistance and effort to stop the war and successful prosecution of the war criminals. Members of my team and hundreds of citizens of Bosnia and Herzegovina requested that today, in front of this committee, I convey their most heartfelt thanks and deep gratitude to the former chairmen of the ICMP, Secretary of State, Mr. Vance, Senator Dole, 
uh, Mr. J. Kimsey, President, Chairman, Ambassador Miller, special gratitude to Her Majesty Queen Noor, who was able to recognize the pain and suffering that was in the hearts of Bosnian mothers, sisters, and daughters, and lend a hand in soothing the grief from human tragedies. Special gratitude to Catherine Boomberg. Without her, we would not have a law for missing persons or the Institute for Missing Persons. Great special thanks to Catherine Boomberg and her assistant. Tens of thousands of Bosnian women and men have found their peace. Mr. Bosovic, thank you very much for your testimony and for the acknowledgments of all the key players, but you left out yourself because you have been a key player for so long and have done an extraordinary job. Let me just uh, ask a few opening questions. And um, first of all, to Queen Noor, if you could. Um, do you find that when families are apprised of the findings, gruesome as they may be, from a mass grave, that they accept it? Or is there a time lag where, um, or that they doubt it? How, how does that work? Push the button, please. Thank you. It, 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 to some extent, it, it depends on the circumstances, how long it has been. But, but it, it is absolutely critical that, that they do finally have that, that information. And as I was saying, I, I found that families in New York City were using exactly the same words to describe their need for closure as families in Bosnia and, and, um, and elsewhere in the region have used to describe their need for that information in order to achieve a personal, emotional, if you will, and, and psychological closure, but also in order to begin to move forward and to look forward to a, a future in which they can be active participants that ultimately can have an impact on the role that they can play in promoting reconciliation and, and, and stability in, in their communities and in, in their countries. And we found that, in fact, in bringing together those who had suffered these losses from the different, um, the, the, the different religious, ethnic, and national groups that, in fact, um, that they were able to find some measure of uh, common, something in their common suffering that enabled them together to look at a different way of living in the future that we also consider to be of great value. You know, you mentioned the 9-11. Uh, almost 60 individuals from my district died in the World Trade Center, and I got to know many, not all, but many of the survivors, and I got to know them quite well. And your point is very well taken. Kristen Breitweiser, who is one of the widows from 9-11, she was affectionately known as one of the Jersey girls, because they were the ones who led the effort to get the 9-11 commission, uh, and they were absolutely tenacious, Three and she and three others. But she told me and a group uh, down here, the first time I met her, uh, that she, you know, had, even though she knew the last point where her husband was in the World Trade Center, last location, um, she still wondered, was he there, you know, was he, because she wasn't on the phone with him, and it was when she got her ring back, his, his ring, obviously the wedding ring, um, with a finger, as gruesome as that is, and it is gruesome, that she began to have closure, that he did indeed die, and yet we all watched, uh, I mean, there was no question where it all happened. Now, in a battlefield, obviously, and, and natural disasters, there's certainly um, greater room for skepticism um, about, so that, which is why the DNA is so important. Let me ask you, uh, or just uh, back in 1998, March 31st, sitting right where Mr. Bray is sitting, I chaired a hearing um, of my subcommittee. It was called the Subcommittee on International Operations and Human Rights. And we heard from Hassan Nuhanovic, who was the translator uh, when Milotic met with the Dutch peacekeepers. And this was three years after the 1995 genocide occurred. As a matter of fact, we had a hearing that I also chaired right here on mass graves and other atrocities in Bosnia in December of 95. But the full weight of what had happened there was still streaming out. Uh, in 1998, here's the man who had his whole family, or much of his family, disappear right in front of his midst, said, the Dutch not only turned the people over to the Serbs, but also tried to hide the evidence about it. They hid the list of 239 people from the Batari camp. They did nothing to find out what had happened to those men and boys. We know it was 8,000 strong, uh, including some women, including my mother. 
until I visited the Dutch Defense Ministry in The Hague in January of 1997. Then he went on to say, there was no news about the fate of the people. Still, this was three years after, after that genocide. Uh, the need for your organization and the work of all of you uh, is so extraordinarily important. One, for the families. Secondly, for governments, including friendly governments, you know, the so-called safe haven at Srebrenica, uh, where the Dutch peacekeepers literally handed over to Milanic uh, people for slaughter. Uh, then, you know, what ensued thereafter was anything but a transparent uh, and open investigation. There was efforts to hide what had happened. So uh, the importance of holding to account governments, holding to account friendly governments, not just those who per perpetrate the crimes, uh, I think cannot be understated. So I, I thank you for the work that you're doing. Um, I, would, I would ask you, you know, if, if any of you would like to answer it, you know, dictatorships are always harder to deal with, um, and whether or not you have found uh, in your work uh, where access to the battlefield or even access to a, a natural disaster is hindered or hampered by uh, the, the fact that it might be a dictatorship like China. Even Vietnam, you know, the, the, we have Americans, World War II, 73,000 MIAs, Korean War, almost 8,000, uh, Vietnam, 1,689, still uh, MIA. Uh, the latter two, World War II, we had access to the battlefield globally, not, or almost total access. Many died on ships, so th those men and women will never be known where uh, they died. But in Korea, no access to North Korea at all, very little, uh, you know, over the years. And Vietnam, obviously, it has been done very, very slowly over the course of many years. So my question is about the access in dictatorships or authoritarian regimes. Has it been your experience to find that's harder? You mentioned 9 million in Iraq. I'm not sure if that was during Hussein or, or more recent. Uh, well, Iraq breaks down. Well, one footnote to your uh, what you were saying initially uh, 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 at the beginning about um, the the translator. We have actually, in fact, identified now all of Hassan's family. It's just a small footnote, but it is a, a little example of what um, ICMP. The, the impact that, that um, we've had on so many families. I wish all of them, but um, a, a large percentage of them. Uh, it, yes, it does de it depend on uh, it, 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 every country's circumstances are slightly different, and we've had a, a, a range of, of, um, uh, of experiences uh, de that are very much affected by the legal and, and uh, political systems in in, um, in different countries. And in, in Iraq, we have been training people from Iraqi ministries in um, scientific methods to, to evacuate mortal remains. But just as in, in Bosnia, Herzegovina, and, and, um, and, and the Balkans, in uh, countries like Iraq and others like Libya, which have asked for our help as well, in Lebanon, um, there are... Um, uh, different parties that have different vested interests in either exposing the full truth and, and all the information about these cases or in trying to conceal them and, and as I said in my remarks, uh, or cover up for previous regimes. So uh, there are a variety of different circumstances. I don't know if you have um, uh, perhaps some observations on, on that. And, and we as an independent, impartial organization feel we are well suited um, and we have been able to provide information in court cases because we are respected and uh, understood to be an impartial organization able to operate in ways that other entities like ICRC and other uh, entities are not as able to do uh, today. I would agree that it depends country to country. Um, with Interpol, you have 190 member countries that come together voluntarily. Um, within the U.S., we refer to the thin blue line connecting law enforcement at all our levels, federal, state, local, and tribal. But I would submit that this line also exists between countries, particularly through Interpol. We often get much accomplished despite geopolitical differences because we're communicating law enforcement to law enforcement to solve crime, to promote humanitarian efforts. I think that's where organizations such as these come into their own. Now, can I say that across the board, that level of cooperation exists within every country? I would not submit that to you. But I would say that uh, every effort that we can make, every tool in the box, should be utilized in such efforts. 
We do have a vote on the floor. There's three, but they will, it'll only take about 10 minutes, and then we'll come back. Um, but I'd like to yield to uh, Mr. Pitts. I know if people have schedules they have to meet, we we'll certainly understand. But we would like to, if you could, just bear with us for 10 minutes after Mr. Pitts' questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Your Majesty. Thank you for your work, and thank you all for your compelling testimony. I would like to uh, ask you, uh, Queen Noor, how can the ICMP success be transferred to other OSCE states faced with the issue of missing persons, and what has been the uh, ICMP's work within OSCE outside of Western Balkans? Uh, we, um, I think that we, we've demonstrated that, first of all, bringing international attention to an issue like this, um, and that's exemplified by the creation of ICMP in the first place, is, it has, is, is one very important factor, and certainly this meeting is, is, is um, a great asset to all of our efforts in that regard. Um, our uh, pioneering DNA technology is another um, asset and, and, and factor that can be um, uh, applicable to successfully addressing um, these problems in other um, OSCE countries. Uh, the fact that governments in, in, in the region of the, of the Western Balkans um, demonstrated the political will to address this issue was absolutely critical to our success. And the fact that we also um, adopted an adherence to the rule of law approach, not just a humanitarian approach to the issue, um, also was critical because where persons are missing from conflict and, and uh, human rights abuses, it's a consequence of, of criminal activity, and that's very different from persons missing from, for example, natural disasters. And it's that government cooperation uh, working in this case with the International Criminal Court um, and domestic courts helped to expedite the process of uh, locating missing persons. And then our use of DNA technology enabling them to um, accurately identify the missing, that combination was critical to our success in the Western Balkans and also is certainly um, ap applicable to the larger um, OSCE. Uh, countries. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we've only got five minutes. So I think I'll have to submit my questions in writing. Thank you. Well, just to best use, I hope I don't miss the vote. Let me ask a couple of other questions. Um, the ICMP has stated that it needs certain immunities to cover its operations outside of the Western Balkans, uh, where it has been granted quasi international status. How does the absence of these immunities impact or impede the ICMP's uh, work? Uh, well, there are. Um, uh, it, it is finding that the ad hoc. We've been finding that the ad hoc approach that we have had to date is is not really sustainable. We, we haven't had a permanent formal legal status, but rather a series of bilateral agreements with, with various countries. And for example, just to be very specific, some countries um, have claimed to be reluctant to conclude agreements with us because we don't have a permanent internationally recognized legal status. And um, this has stopped at least one project from going ahead in Colombia um, that would have supported U.S. interests in resolving dubious claims um, about the armed struggle uh, against the FARC guerrillas. It, it also makes it difficult for us to assist in excavation of mass graves related, for example, to the regime crimes in, in Iraq um, and providing DNA-based identity testing assistance. It, it is, I think, uh, uh, absolutely critical that we are able to continue this um, independent, impartial approach, and while we've demonstrated its efficacy um, in, in the Western Balkans and to some extent in other services we've provided to other countries, um, it, we are finding that this, um, what we've been talking to, to um, the Commission about and what we very much hope the United States will be able to advocate for us um, in terms of that um, uh, international le formal legal status will enable us to be able to respond to and much more effectively address the um, a range of different 
problems in different countries that are urgently asking for our, our help. And those range from Iraq, but also, as I mentioned earlier, Libya, um, in Latin America, and, and, and elsewhere, of course. Let me ask um, uh, Ms. Tislova. About 5,000 Chechens still remain unaccounted for from the first and second Chechen wars. Um, without Russian cooperation, what, what can be done? I mean, there, there's a lacking of international law um, on this. As a matter of fact, uh, even if there were access, the concern would be, you know, has a building gone up over a mass grave? Has it been concreted, you know, turned into a parking lot? Um, where, how do we preserve? I remember when, even when, and our commission did, was very active on this uh, during the whole Balkan Wars issue, uh, the Balkan Wars, I should say, and that was, there was a loss of, of, of information even, first-hand accounts of the atrocities, never mind the finding of uh, the people who have been slaughtered, but people's, you know, because there was insufficient money being put aside to, to, to initiate war crimes uh, investigations. So what happens when you have a Russia who says uh, no? Well, actually, and that's a very difficult question. I, I'm going to leave uh, the record open and, until you're done your answer. I will come right back, as will other members, as soon as the uh, uh, hearing, uh, as soon as we're done voting. But please continue with your, your statement. Um, there is a human rights organization called uh, Memorial in Russia. They do a great job um, by helping people to discover uh, the bodies of their loved ones. And uh, uh, memorial is not very much loved or favored by the Russian government. Uh, there is no uh, actually job done from the Russian government side or uh, a very, and very little job done by the Chechen government uh, to discover mass graves and to um, and punish this crime. Also, there is another issue. In um, during the war, a lot of uh, Chechens were detained, uh, and they remain in prison, and they are still reported as missing persons. That's another uh, part of the problem. Um, I really don't know what can be done if, uh, when Russian side says no. It's a difficult question. Um, uh, the only my suggestion is probably to work to the, with directly with the human rights organizations in Chechnya and in Russia to support them and uh, to help them to organize this uh, search for mass graves. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sova. The congressman has three votes, and uh, then we'll resume. So we'll go into temporary recess. Thanks. The Commission will resume its hearing, and I apologize uh, profusely for that delay. Uh, there were, were three votes on the House floor. Let me just ask a question with regards to human trafficking. In 2010, we saw a victim identification drop in Europe. There were 14,650 trafficking victims uh, found in 2009, but only 8,548 were found in 2010. In Bosnia, specifically, authorities identified 37 tracking, trafficking victims in 2010 compared with 46 victims in 2009. Uh, the annual TIP report, or Trafficking Persons Report, required by my legislation, indicates that local experts report police are not using proactive identification techniques to locate victims increasingly kept in more private locations throughout the country. All stakeholders report a lack of clarity in the current procedures used for identification and referral, and local experts report multiple instances of potential victims not being recognized as such. Uh, my question, I guess, to all of you, uh, Mr. Bray, to you as well, uh, would you agree with that assessment? Are we seeing any other factors? How can, uh, have you noticed an overall shift, perhaps in deprioritizing the recovery of missing persons? From a U.S. perspective, I wouldn't say we have any shift. I wouldn't say it's been deprioritized here at all. As a matter of fact, the Department of Justice and Department of Homeland Security both have very robust programs, uh, specifically through the FBI and ICE, on victim identification. I think there are persistent issues that still exist with victims, um, particularly those in the United States, obtaining correct identification, making a positive uh, assessment of status. 
those all play into that. As far as Interpol and in the international community, I know that victim identification con continues to be an issue there, and it becomes part of their training regimen and their capacity building regimen, which we'll see uh, deployed here in the near future in Central America in a partnership with the United States government. So we'll, we'll look to identify the weaknesses through an assessment and then act on those and build some capacity and then follow that up with an operational phase and see if we can't help shift that a little bit. Okay, thank you. Please. I would just add that. Could you uh, push the, uh, oh, thank you. Ken, uh, I would add simply that there is currently no mechanism outside of the International Commission on Missing Persons that can link governments and families of the missing on, on a global level. So if a trafficked woman from Ukraine, for example, goes missing in another country, there is currently no way to search for her in, in a way that uses genetic information um, in, in cross-border or uh, in, in, in a global context. Um, so we, we have a proven track record of of sharing this information and in, in uh, helping to share this information in real time online with governments and families of the missing. So that is one another role that ICMP is is able to play today, and that hopefully will also be part of a larger, more effective international approach. Could you describe the Joint Platform for Disaster Victim Identification? Mr. Bray. Essentially, there's a proposal, a concept, if you will, between ICMP and Interpol to establish a platform by which there's a standing regimen for international response. It would include creating a multidisciplinary, multinational response um, that has been seen and proven effective. I believe the last deployment was Typhoon Frank in 2008. The bottom line is they'll have to establish international standards that can be monitored and updated as needed. They'll have to develop cost-effective technology solutions. Right now we have capacity when it comes to fingerprints and to a certain degree odontology. However, the standards for odontology are still under debate in the U.S. and Europe as well. Um, but DNA, access to high capacity processing of DNA simply isn't there. That's one of those areas that uh, I think ICMP is leading the charge with, and I know that Interpol is looking forward to standing up their global complex for innovation in Singapore and making that one of the platforms for forensic sciences there. And then, of course, training capacity building will become a, a key portion of that uh, strategy, but ultimately those issues will be what rounds out um, that platform. Oh, well, that and international communications among the, the member countries of Interpol to make all that work. Mr. Bosovich, uh, has the other countries come to your Missing Persons Institute seeking guidance and recommendations, uh, lessons learned, if you will? Yes, so, dakle, neke države iz Latinske Amerike, odnosno iz Južne Amerike. Yes, some countries from Latin America. I can't hear you. Yes, in fact, that's true. There are some countries from Latin America region I requested our help. Prepoznali su ovaj model o kojem sam ja govorio u svom izlaganju kao posebnom prepoznatljivom u svijetu bosanskom modelu traženja nestalih, posebno identifikacije velikog broja nestalih osoba. They recognized our Bosnian model, so-called Bosnian model that today exists in Bosnia that uh, is, in fact, a good way of identifying the missing persons and finding. Uglavnom su za sad zainteresirane nevladine organizacije, odnosno vladine, nevladine organizacije koje okupljaju porodice žrtava za neki vid, da kažem, kopiranja ili preuzimanja našeg modela. Uh, mostly right now are uh, interested non-government-led organizations and uh, mostly uh, family members uh, that are involved in these non-government organizations. Dakle, taj naš bosanski model zapravo o, o, se može svesti na, na o, o, tri stvari. O, zajednički rad o, eksperata, vladinih institucija i porodica žrtava. Uh, this Bosnian model can be uh, based on three main factors, and that's collaboration between the government and the victims' families, 
than help from the international community. Kad kažem eksperata, mislim i na lokalne eksperte u državi i svakako u slučaju regije, mislim na ICMP kao, kao jednu intervladnu organizaciju koja okuplja eksperte ne samo iz oblasti DNA analiza, nego i eksperte iz forenzike, arheologije, antropologije. As well the forensic specialists that are involved in the international uh, community and helping us to identify and um, not just forensic pathologists but many experts that are helping giving our, their hands in, in effort to help. I mislim da je ovaj naš model primjenjiv u, u bilo kojoj drugoj zemlji koja je bila suočena bilo sa agresijom, bilo sa ratovima, unutrašnjim nemirima, o, prirodnim katastrofama ili katastrofama izazvanim ljudskim djelovanjima. I believe that this Bosnian model can in fact be used in many different countries, countries that are faced with natural disasters, disasters caused by human factors or caused by genocide and war crimes. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Tislova, the, the uh, Fred Cooney of Texas disappeared in Chechnya. Uh, are you aware as to whether or not he, information was ever ascertained about him? Uh, Congressman Frank Wolf, who visited Chechnya during the second war there, um, asked me to ask that question. Um, actually, I'm not aware uh, okay. uh, of uh, if there were ever any information, you know, to, to already known that he's missing. No, there was no information, unfortunately. Let me ask the Queen Noor if I could. Do you believe that there's sufficient prioritization within the international community on the work that your organization and the, the work itself? Um, I, I just came back from the OSCE Parliamentary Assembly in Vienna, just got back with uh, some of my colleagues uh, on the staff. And um, while we all have pointed to Bosnia over the years and the Balkans in particular, uh, you know, Russia still does not allow access, um, like in Chechnya. Uh, you mentioned Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, you know, the, these frozen conflicts where the animosity continues unabated. Uh, I don't think we spend enough time on it, and I would appreciate your thoughts on that, whether or not you think we do at the OSCE, at uh, the European Union, and of course the U.S. government and U.N. Clearly, um, the United States and, and uh, the, those European uh, countries that, that have supported, uh, support, that supported the creation of the Commission on Missing Persons and, and then have um, partnered with us in, in the years since um, deserve, I think, an enormous amount of credit for uh, taking a leap of faith in an organization uh, that at that time was an outline, a concept, but uh, no one, I think, could have anticipated what it, it could accomplish uh, and that I've already laid out um, today. Uh, today, we are deeply concerned by the uh, the fact that our, our mission in the Balkans is, is uh, at the moment coming to a, a close in the coming year and that uh, we, are, we do not have the funding um, or, the, as I said, the international legal status to be able to uh, take on the load of, of requests and, and, and um, um, challenges that, that uh, the international community is, is presenting us to today. And, and many of these are um, uh, problems not only in, in, in uh, Europe, but also in other parts of the world that uh, d d d um, critically need the kind of support that we can provide. Uh, both scientific, um, training, uh, the, the, the various different forms that I described earlier, in order to put uh, conflicts of the past to rest on, in, in so many different levels on the personal, communal, and national, and even regional um, basis. And I, I, we are here today in part because we believe that the United States um, in, in demonstrating its ongoing support to us uh, can have an impact on a number of other countries whose support we also need. And, uh, and, and God willing, we, we will see a, um, uh, in, in, in your support and, or your interests, which we hope will 
manifest itself in 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 support well, already there so. in the support of the, of, of um, your government that that we actually can perhaps move on to another um, uh, onto another level of of operation internationally and uh, continue this pioneering um, work that that really is playing such an important role in the international community. We are joined by uh, Congresswoman Kathy McMorris Rogers. I'd like to yield to my friend and colleague. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I was just here to to listen. Okay. Yes. <laughs> well, we were Appreciate talking it. about the hearing uh, uh, over on the floor, and uh, Ms. McMorris Rogers pointed out she read your book. Thank you. We, it, it, I, I touched upon um, the, the Western Balkans in the book, um, but there's a great deal more. Uh, and, and we are leaving documents uh, from the meeting today in case you're interested in any of the, um, the work of the International Commission on Missing Persons and, and uh, the, the other presentations here today. But we're so grateful for the, the, the interest and, and the, the opportunity that we have today to talk about these issues that we've been, all of us, I think, are in agreement, are not given the attention that they deserve and, and um, that if, if given um, could probably have quite a, a, a significant impact on helping to promote stability um, it, through more effective uh, um, recovery from conflict and uh, God willing prevention of future conflict arising from uh, the, the kinds of situations that um, that missing persons, at least from conflict, um, uh, the, the, the dynamics that that can set in place if not addressed fully, as we have seen in the, in, in the Balkans and we see today, unfortunately, in other parts of the Middle East and, and um, Asia and, and even Latin America. So we're very grateful for the interest and support of this commission. Let me just uh, ask my final question. Um, One of the other hats that I wear is as chairman of the Africa Global Health Global Human Rights Committee and takes me to Africa frequently, including to Addis, where the African Union uh, sits. And I'm wondering if the work of the ICMP has been uh, sought by the AU, the African Union, whether or not uh, David Crane's Sierra Leone court used some of the expertise that you've developed, or the Rwandan court, for that matter, uh, since obviously they're, they're very similar to the Yugoslav court. Could you put on your... Uh, so sorry again. We haven't been approached by the AU um, and, um, uh, and Rwanda also. Uh, no, um, we haven't been approached. We... Uh, are we providing technical assistance to any African country? No, not, not currently. We have received requests, uh, and Rwanda is one case, but at the moment, no, we're not. Uh, but that would also underscore why further absolutely. Uh, strengthening of, of your ability to do international work absolutely. Uh, is all the more warranted, so that you could share that expertise. Would any of you like to say anything before we conclude? Uh, final comments? An extraordinary panel, uh, Mr. Brink. And I want to thank you so much. Uh, the information that you have provided will be shared very, very widely with all of the other members, the commissioners, uh, and will help us in our conversations with the executive branch, especially. Oh, yes. Please. I yield to uh, Ms. McMorris Rogers. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, well, I'll just uh, ask a couple of questions since we have some time here. Uh, first, to, to Queen Noor, how do, how do you see the ICMP's work differing from the work carried out by the International Committee of the Red Cross? We, we are um, a, uh, an independent, impartial uh, ent entity that is able to, in fact, uh, work in, in um, different arenas, especially as so much of our approach is based on, um, on rule of law and the, the importance not only of um, science, also our emphasis on DNA, it, it distinguishes us, but also on the ability to introduce into court testimony uh, our, our findings that, and that which has 
proven to be a part of the reason we've been so successful, for example, in the Western Balkans. The, these are both areas that, in which our work differs from um, any other organization, really, and why we've been able to be effective at, at, um, at, at in, in demonstrating that it's not just a humanitarian challenge, but it, it is a, a rule of law and, and really government credibility challenge in mm -hmm. so many different countries and in helping these or these the countries we've worked with craft legislation and develop rule of law institutions for tackling this problem we've shown how uh, how important that approach can be in generating the kind of success which has been unprecedented thank you and then uh, to mr. Bray Disappearances in some countries occur without the knowledge and, and complicity of the very state agencies that have access to the Interpol system. What mechanisms does Interpol have in place to prevent such internal corruption from degrading the overall quality of the information Interpol maintains? Well, first off, Interpol is an organization of international law enforcement for law enforcement. So immediately there should be a commitment, and I realize this sounds a little altruistic, but there should be a commitment to honor and respect the rules under which we all uh, agree to operate. Having said that, there is a commission for the control of files which does review uh, notices that are published in, in contradiction to, to the established rules and certainly the Constitution of Interpol. Having said that, Interpol constantly reviews these rules and updates them. The last update was just now, uh, this past November at the General Assembly in Hanoi, was uh, approved with an overwhelming majority and will be implemented in June. So that'll give Interpol a greater review authority and a greater ability to revoke those notices that fall outside of those uh, specifications. Okay, thank you. Um, and then um, uh, Fatima Tisova from The Voice of America. I just uh, I had a question, uh, a direct consequence of the Russian government shying away from its responsibility and atrocities committed during the Chechen wars is a lack of commitment on its part to the identification cause. There are no laws in place to prevent actions that seriously compromise the identification process construction workers building around and over graves, for example. In current international law, there lacks a mechanism to protect the rights of the missing unidentified, and as a result, governments are able to block or hinder the identification process, making it exceedingly difficult for organizations and individuals to identify the missing. How can we be begin to develop the mechanisms or legislation to address this shortcoming in the current law, and is it feasible? Or has there ever been a movement in that direction, and what is the progress? I can start from uh, with an example. Uh, in the city of Rostov on Don, there are still refrigerators from the first Chechen war, uh, full with the bodies of Russian soldiers, young men who were recruited by the government, sent to Chechnya, killed, and still, I. I am not identified and sent to their uh, parents, their families, and they still are counted as missing. So for the government who does not care for its own soldiers, um, it is very difficult to believe that it's going to care for the, uh, the other part, for the victims uh, which it considered at the time as enemies, and uh, for the, uh, especially for the combatant. Uh, part. So, um, in my view, if this bill will be passed and the Commission will be granted the status, probably um, the immunity to be a global Commission uh, with the possibility to access without uh, government um, restrictions to any place, uh, probably like Red Cross or at other organizations, that would be a solution. The other part is to, as I said before, to deal directly to contact to the non-government, through the non-government um, channels and to um, help people on the ground who try to um, 
be involved. And also there is a lack of personnel, uh, lack of finances, uh, corruption. Uh, altogether, all these problems uh, create uh, you know, a measure um, inability for the Russian state, maybe um, a lack of will to solve this problem. So uh, my suggestion is uh, uh, two ways, probably, to, uh, to create an international organization, probably, uh, to grant the, this commission uh, access to the area without uh, permission from the local governments, or to, to, to work directly with, um, and through NGO channels. Thank you, uh, and it was great just to have the chance to hear some. I appreciate everything that you all are doing all around the world on this issue. Thanks. Uh, we have three minutes to vote, so the hearing's adjourned. Thank you so very much for your extraordinary uh,